life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello. 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 <laughs> this is Marshall. I am Lainey. I'm Corey. And today we are going to be talking about Season 2, Episode 8 of The Walking Dead, Nebraska. So this is coming after a very shocking, heavy episode where we find out that Sophia is no longer alive. She's a walker. And she's not even undead anymore. <laughs> yeah. She's re-dead. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the viewership for this episode. It originally aired on AMC in the United States on February 12th, 2012. Upon airing, it attained 8.1 million viewers and a 4.2 rating in the 18 to 49 demographic. The ratings and total viewership increased significantly from the previous installment of Pretty Much Dead Already, which garnered 6.62 million views. Probably because everyone wanted to come back and be like, what, what happened? What? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe a lot of them were wondering, you know, can we get the story of how she got there? Right. But, but you never not, do. We are never going to get that. Never going to get it. Never, never. going to get a lot of things from Kirkman. That's one of them. True that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start this episode, how the last episode ended, looking straight down the barrel of Rick's gun. As Sophia's body is on the ground, but guess what? It's in a different position than it was at the end of the last episode. And we're going to find that this episode, just like the episode before it and the episode after it, is going to be riddled with production and continuity errors, and we're just, we're going to lay it out for you. Right. They were a little bit more focused on the plot and a little less focused on making sure everything was perfect. The production yeah. team couldn't see through their tears. Yes. Yeah. So at 47 seconds in, there's a bunch of continuity errors. Let's run them down. So Carol breaks free from Daryl. Like she's crying. Daryl has her, right? After Sophia gets shot. Carol breaks free from Daryl and... When she does, Andrea is kind of like in the front of the scene and she turns her head and watches Carol over her shoulder. But moments later, you can see that Andrea is turning around and walking away from Daryl's side. And then moments after that, the same shot of Andrea looking over her shoulder at Carol is shown. So this is more of like an editing problem because mm -hmm. they decided to reuse the same shot yeah. in a different spot. The second time that happens in this moment is Carol, when she breaks away from Daryl, you can see that she's clearly running up to the farmhouse. You can see her in the background running. But in the next shot, Beth is running towards Rick, kind of in Rick's area, not to Rick, but more towards her mother. And you can see that Carol is in the open barn doors, not at the farmhouse. Mm. So she I don't know what happened there. That yeah, was really, that's really like weird. opposite directions. Okay. So there are a lot of people crying right now. And Beth is now with her mom and her brother. Her mom is not technically dead dead. It's not completely immobilized. Not, not really. And so she grabs for Beth. And there's this whole thing where Beth is screaming, crying. And everyone's trying to work to get Beth away. And Andrea comes up and kills her with a pickaxe. She just wanted one last hug. Sure. <laughs> then we see an aerial shot of the barn area. And we can confirm that I counted 16 bodies. But that's 16 bodies with Sophia. Yeah, that's what I counted too. Okay. So the last time I believe we said it was 16 bodies without Sophia. Yes. So this is a separate shooting time, more than likely. Mm -hmm. And then they, they kind of put everybody in, but then somebody just wasn't available or... Right. They just missed it. Which is kind of crazy because you think, well, if this was the end of a season, some of that would make sense, but it wasn't. So. But no. Uh, there was a slight filming hiatus, but not a lot. We're back at the farmhouse, though, and Shane is accusing Herschel of knowing that Sophia was in the barn. And Herschel says, no, Otis must have put her there before he died. Well, this doesn't totally make sense to me because Otis left for FEMA... The night they brought Shane in and yeah. Carl and Daryl found the farmhouse with fresh sardines on the table after that. Correct. 
So this timeline for Sophia is very wibbly wobbly because when Shane and Rick and Carl were out in the woods and they see the deer and Carl gets shot, it was the day after she went missing. Right. So then the day after that, the sardines were found. Right. But the night before that, Otis died. Right. So yes, this timeline does not work. Unless it wasn't really Sophia in the farmhouse with the sardines. Correct. Yes. Or Herschel and Jimmy put Sophia in the barn. But didn't think that that's who it was. Right. But Well, Herschel wasn't going to risk it no matter what. Even if he knew, he wasn't going to risk them knowing what was in the barn to, you know... Well, yeah, that's for sure. He's never going to do that, so... Right. It doesn't really matter because Herschel wants Shane off his land, and then Shane goes to grab him and Maggie smacks him in the face. It's amazing. Yeah. Here's another continuity error. After Maggie slaps Shane, she goes up to open the door of the farmhouse, and you can see a boom microphone and a huge light reflector in the reflection of the door (laughs) when she opens it. Mm-hmm. It's it's very blink and you miss it, but it is there and I did see it. And I was like, yep, this is about as bad, which, Corey, you weren't here for that episode, when the guy is outside the pharmacy holding on to the horse. Yeah. That you can see in the background. <laughs> it's sh- bad if they were that. They should have just wrapped them all in tinfoil like that Iran video. Right, yeah. <laughs> So Rick and Shane have a discussion about Herschel and the family and whether he covered it up. And Rick tells Shane, you need to calm down here, dude. But then during this conversation, Shane is like, okay, Rick, you're, you're totally delusional about, you know, you're keeping us looking for this dead girl that has been in this barn this whole time. You put us all in danger. But this isn't actually all that delusional. When you really think about it, she's only been gone for like three to four days. Total. Mm-hmm. And during that time, the search is being done with just a handful of people that are oftentimes getting injured. Right. So they aren't having a full search capability. They, she could have been anywhere. Yeah, like mm-hmm. those thing, those movies where you see where there's a missing kid and they have the whole town come exactly. out and just comb through the forest. They don't have that. Yeah. And so three to four days for finding her is, like, not that much. Mm-mm. Especially given they actually had clues. I don't totally agree with your assessment that it's three to four days. I think it's more like seven. They may have just not shown us days in the middle of there. But it does, if you go by when things break up, it really does feel like it's three to four days in this season alone. And then it was three days for the first season. Mm -hmm. There is a shot of the farm from overhead and you see a windmill with arrow motor on the tail. So this is a wind powered water pump. It is from the Aero Motor Windmill uh, Corporation, which has continuously manufactured windmills since 1888 oh. and is the only windmill manufacturer in the United States. It currently resides in San Angelo, Texas. And when we see this thing, at first you just see that, but then you zoom out and you can see that the windmill is just going hardcore. It's spinning super fast. The leaves are flying and above there's these clouds and they're moving pretty fast and they're really dense. So you can tell that given what's going on, a storm is brewing both literally and figuratively. And they're using this as visual language to tell us that. Right. Yeah. Andrea's in front of the barn and she's covering Sophia up with a blanket. Carol is in the RV. And you can also see that there are some math flashcards and some felt tip markers on the table. There are also keys in the ignition of the RV. That's where they keep the keys, apparently for a quick getaway, just in case you need to go fast. You know where they are. They've been in this situation where they needed to go fast already. Mm -hmm. Then Daryl comes in and he just looks at Carol. Looks at her. Yeah, it's a no dialogue situation. No dialogue, just looking. Well, it's the man who's the one one major holdout of hope for her daughter. And maybe this is the point, too, where he starts to think in his mind about having this nice little temper tantrum that he has over the next two episodes. Uh, But we will definitely talk about that (laughs) one later. At the farmhouse, Glenn asks Maggie if she knew Sophia was in the barn and she, she just doesn't even answer him. She's like, really, (laughs) really, you really think I knew? But at the same time, like from that answer, he kind of gets that. Okay. 
Yeah, you didn't know. So there's also a painting of the barn and the windmill on the wall behind Maggie as she walks towards Glenn, which I thought was funny. It's one of those situations where it's like they wanted to be reminded of the things that were outside of their farmhouse and bring it inside their farmhouse. It was so weird. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe the dead zombie stepmom made that painting and that's why they held on to it. That's possible. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So like I said, she doesn't really answer Glenn, but she says maybe they can just move on from everything. And then Maggie asks what happens after they bury all the bodies. And Glenn says he doesn't know. She wants to know what is happening with the group, what's happening with him. That's basically what she wants to know, right? And then it just kind of cuts. Like it, it, it doesn't really even feel like they had a full thought there. It feels like they cut him while he was talking. Mm. At the barn, Carl and Lori haven't really left. They're still there. Carl says he thought he would be the one to find her, which I'm not exactly sure why he thought that. But he doesn't blame Rick for shooting her because he would have done the same thing. And the look on Lori's face is like, uh, wow. Yeah. Child. <laughs> it's another one of those wake up calls that she's not in the world that she was in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She she constantly is getting reminded that hello, wake up. But like yeah. he he admits that he had full hope that finding her. That's why he really wanted to be in on that search. He wanted to be the one to find her. Right. So, Lori asked Dale to take Carl up to the house at that point. T-Dog wants to know if they should start burying, but Andrea says that Carol would like a service first. And that then T-Dog kind of, he's like, yeah, I think we all want that. Mm-hmm. He wants it because he is a huge teddy bear. Yeah, he is. So then it someone says, I can't remember, I forgot to write this down, but someone says they will bury the ones they love and burn the rest. I think it's Andrea. Who yeah, it is. Lori asks what Herschel says. And Rick says... Yeah, he says he wants us off the farm, or at least Shane. Rick is really taking, like, a savior's mentality here because he's taking everything on himself. Every He should have found Sophia. He should have known what was happening. He should have helped control what was going on so Herschel wouldn't throw him off, etc., etc. Like, he's really taking it all on himself at this point. It's like one more brick in his house of insanity that we'll come to later. Right. When, yeah. Yeah, it's just one more bit of burden for him to, like... Yeah. At the same time, like as a leader, you kind of have to look for the source of a problem in increasing circles around your own feet. The problem is the circle around his own foot seems to be everywhere. He doesn't see where things are actually someone else's fault. Right. Over at the RV camp, Shane is getting into the blue truck to start burying the walkers, loading them into the back. And Dale is just staring at him. I think this episode should be entitled People Staring at Other People. Yes. Uh, So Shane looks at Dale in his side mirror and then calls him out as the moral authority. Like, what do you think you are, you know, with your moralness, whatever. And then he asks, what exactly do you do around here, Dale? And uh, let me just tell you, uh, Dale is the person who sees everything. He tends to be the one person that people talk to, reveal the secrets to, share things with. He's always the first to take watch or get something done to protect somebody else. He takes initiative. Even if it's not always the right call, he takes that initiative to protect. Like with the guns, when he tried Mm -hmm. to hide the guns. So that's what he did. (laughs) This is what he does, Shane. (laughs) He's the oracle. Yes. Yes. He's a lookout and he's a collector of information and dispatch. Yeah, he's kind of like the human alarm system in a way where Mm -hmm. he, he sees threats before they happen. Right. So Shane is obviously still very mad about the fact that Dale took away his guns before and that Dale knows his secrets, probably about Otis. But he's also like really self-conscious about the fact that Shane has done all these wrong things and Dale knows. And then Dale looks like he wants to beat him over the head with his rifle at that point. (laughs) And Dale, it's so funny. It's like, it's like one of those situations where you got like a parent and a child and the parent is just looking at the child and the child comes up. I didn't do anything wrong. It wasn't me. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. That's exactly what was happening here. Dale says nothing through the entire thing. Because even in silence, the truth is still true. And no matter how much Shane yells and tries to say that things are one way, the truth is the complete opposite. So I'd like to imagine a flashback of Dale. And then he had a boss that was just like Shane. 
<laughs> and so that he knows what to look for. He's like, uh uh-uh, uh, not this guy. After that they are burying the bodies and they are digging three graves. Yeah, so they've no. got they've got the three graves and then they're gonna burn all the, all the remainder. Rest. So they're they're burying Sophia, Maggie's stepmom, and stepbrother. Mm-hmm. And you can also see like this entire time, as the episode has gone on, Shane's mouth is just getting a bigger and bigger grimace to the point that it, he stops looking like he has a face anymore. He just has Grimace with eyes right over the top of it. <laughs> yeah, there's a scene where he walks off camera and he's that full... Brrr. Yeah. At the RV, Carol and Daryl are in there and then Lori walks in. Now, I noticed something that looked kind of like a clock up above Daryl's shoulder, but Marshall said it's not a clock. What is it? Okay, so you have this hexagonal clock-looking thing, or octagonal, but it only has one hand... And each position on the octagon is a word. I can't read those words, but none of them are the right length for a number. Oh. So it isn't a clock. It's more than likely kind of like, you know, how the Weasleys have a, this is where I am kind of thing. Right. It's like a, my current mood meter, probably. Oh, yeah. Like- the only alternate to that is it could say six-ish, nine-ish. That's true. Yeah, it it could have. It just, it didn't look like it, but it could have been anything. I couldn't read those words. Mm. Lori tells Carol they're ready for the service. And Carol says that that thing is not Sophia. Sophia died a long time ago. And Daryl's face is really feeling something in this moment. Like, I think there's a lot of guilt there. I think there's a lot of, like, feelings of the fact of loss and failure that he is dealing with in this moment, too. This is kind of the moment where something in him just kind of goes snap. Not off the deep end snap, but finally a wall breaks. And it's also kind of the the way you can see where Daryl ends up being Rick's brother mm-hmm. later on. Because they have that kind of similar nature where they want to take it on themselves. Mm-hmm. At the farmhouse, Herschel is looking at pictures of the, his family. He's packing up his wife's things, and he finds a flask. And at first I was like, wait, wait, didn't he not drink before? As we come to find out, he did not. Yep. And, and we will talk about that later, but basically he stopped drinking the day that Maggie was born. Yeah, and um, it's been a dry household ever since. Ever since. And then we have a shot of the service, and it's really interesting how the family is split up. Herschel's family is on the left and the others are on the right and Glenn is in the middle. It's kind of like the bridge between the two. It's really beautiful shots of them on the land from above and far away. The way they they shoot this whole scene is really great. And I noticed that after the service, Shane is the first one to leave. Yeah, because he just can't handle this. All of this is his fault. Right. In the forest, Carol finds a Cherokee rose. And she's really angry because the promise wasn't technically fulfilled. This is a prophetic moment. Look at the flowers, Carol. Mm, Mm -hmm. Exactly. But at the same time, we all, we remember from the episode with Cherokee Rose, we described the rose and it, like all other roses, has thorns. And she just goes to town, ripping this thing out of the ground, tearing up the stems. And she's doing so without any gloves. So, you know, she's about to get messed up. Yeah, for really sure. Really messed up. Back at the barn, Andrea and T Dog are clearing up the rest of the walkers and they're putting them in the back of the truck. And I can estimate that there's about six. From multiple shots, I can tell there's about six of them right. in there. Okay. And at the same time, like Rick kind of came comes by later and he's he's like, Well, another couple loads and we'll be done. But there's 16 walkers. No, not even, because yeah, you, you minus yeah. three from the, the ones they already buried, there's only 13. So there should only be three... one more load. Yeah, <laughs> there should be one more load. What the heck? Why does he care? He's not doing it. <laughs> he doesn't do the math, no. So there's a difference of opinion about how everything is being handled right now, and there's a whole discussion. I, it's not really that important. Then Andrea chooses to sit in the back of the truck with the bodies, and at first I thought, Why? Why can't you just put the thing up and go sit in the front? Yeah, because as it starts to drive off, one of their arms falls off. And she's like, oh, stop, stop. And she runs and puts it back on. Mm-hmm. All those wet, sloppy <laughs> sounds. It's disgusting, that sound. It they really did a good is. job with the weight of the arm, too, because it looked mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. At the farmhouse, Maggie wonders to Glenn, you know, are you going to stay? Why aren't you staying with me if they leave? And he said he didn't really know that that was an option. I mean... They've never had this kind of discussion at all. And then 
In the kitchen, Beth faints from shock, but now they can't find Herschel. So they're running around the house. And Rick says, well, you know, is there a bar in town? Maybe he went to a bar or something. And this is where Maggie says that Herschel gave up drinking when she was born and he's no longer a drinker. And they talk about the bar and Maggie says the name of the bar is called Hatlands. Now I'm going to tell you that this is a whole convoluted mess about what this bar is really called. Mm -hmm. Because the sign when we get there later on, actually says the carriage bar, but it is called something else to Herschel. So a little bit about this bar. You can get a bunch of different drinks. You can get cold beers. You can get milk. It was mentioned by Herschel in the episode pretty much dead already when they're taking the two walkers out of the creek that one of them was Louise Bush who worked at this bar on the weekends and he refers to it as Hapman's Bar with a P. Mm -hmm. not Hatlin's Bar with a T. So it could possibly refer to the owner of the bar, like his name, that's the bar, not the name of the bar, but that's the person who owns the bar. That makes sense, because to him, he wouldn't call it the name of a bar, because he doesn't go there. So I don't know the difference between the Hatlin's and the Hapman's thing that's happening there. Uh, It It, could just be an error of speak. Yeah, Yeah. almost likely it is. Uh, They didn't catch it and redo it. Because that kind of scene was going is a difficult scene to shoot where they're, you know, catching the zombies. So they might have just, it might have just slipped through and they just let it go. Right, maybe. <laughs> Glenn says he will take Rick to the bar. So he's stepping up, not just in the eyes of like Maggie and Herschel, but, you know, using his skills as the And she actually out. tries to hold him back. Yeah. He's like, no, this is something I can do and I'm go- we're going to be safe about it. And then Lori and Shane tell Rick not to go after Herschel. Lori is concerned that Carl is getting cold But Rick says they need Herschel for the baby. So when she says she's concerned about Carl getting cold, she means in his attitude. And we're like, what child are you looking at right now? He's not getting cold. He's maturing. She is totally misunderstanding when he said that he would shoot Sophia as a zombie. Because she's seeing this as a, well, he doesn't care. She's a corpse now. But really, he's seeing it as a, she wouldn't want to be this way. So I'll... I'll give her that mercy. Mm-hmm. I want to be the one to give her mercy. She's just projecting her fear. Right. It's, mm-hmm. it's basically, you know, like, again, she's not facing the fact of how you have to live in this world. It's not that you have to turn into a Shane, but you have to recognize certain facts. You don't hug a zombie. <laughs> Rick is uh, getting in the car and he notices behind him that Glenn and Maggie are kind of saying goodbye and kissing. And he was just too busy before to realize this is what was happening. But he's like, oh, well, that's cool. (laughs) It's in the car. We move over to somewhere near the chicken coop on the farm. And Shane is getting some water and he hears a rustling. And it's Carol coming back out of the woods after she's tore up all the Cherokee roses. And she has some scrapes. So Shane starts to clean her up. And he keeps saying over and over again that he didn't know she was there. And he's kind of like stumbling over his words a little bit every single time that he tries to make another excuse for what he did he can't finish the sentence so the only ones that he can actually say is that he didn't know that she was there and that he was trying to keep everyone safe everything else is a lie and he knows it and he can't say it for once at the farmhouse dale and Lori are talking about how things are going downhill and that Shane may have killed Otis, and he may have killed someone else sooner or later. But Dale doesn't bring up to Lori that he once saw Shane aim his gun right at Rick. Well, that's really not going to do anything. Like, yeah. it's just going to freak Lori out even more. So. Yeah, you don't, yeah. Like, it's, there's, that's, that's a bomb that you don't drop. It, truth, I just it, feel, truth for truth's sake doesn't help anything in that I just feel like if he's trying to convince her that he is that Shane is a dangerous person, that's your biggest evidence. It's not just, well, I think maybe he did this and I think he did this and I think he did this. I saw him do this. Mm -hmm. And that is an evil thing. But Dale knows how to weigh the consequences. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like you're telling somebody that a stand in husband was about to kill the first husband. That's a bomb you don't drop lightly. There's another gorgeous shot through the trees of Lori and Dale as as we are seeing them have this conversation. Again, a lot of these really beautiful shots that are coming in from the same cinematographer. We're in the town 
and Glenn and Rick are talking in the car. Glenn can't believe that Maggie might love him. And Rick is laughing because he totally gets this, right? Mm -hmm. He gets what's happening. And tells him to tell her that he loves her when they get back. And he doesn't even ask, do you love her? It's just, just tell her when you get back. Because he knows. Like, Uh he kind of knows it in him. Yeah. And this is where you can see the sign that says the carriage bar. As they're kind of walking up, Glenn does kind of say, well, I I revealed these things to people. I knew about these things. I just didn't think I should tell anybody. And Rick says, well, don't worry about it. You did what you thought was right. It just so happens it wasn't. Like, (laughs) that was a really great line. (laughs) At the farmhouse, Beth is in bed and a lot of people are in the room with her. And they say her heart is racing and she's burning up. Then Lori asks Andrea to go take care of Carl. So just really briefly, what do you think is wrong with Beth? After a quick bit of research, and I'm just kind of inserting this afterwards, she is suffering from what is called malignant catatonia. This type happens when symptoms lead to other health problems, like dangerous changes in blood pressure, body temperature, or breathing or heart rate. Someone who's catatonic for a long time may be more likely to have problems like dehydration, blood clots, or kidney failure as a result of the symptoms. And we do start to see in the next episode, I believe it is, that she is starting to suffer from dehydration, although we don't see the other effects. Now, what causes this kind of catatonia, doctors aren't entirely certain. It happens most often with people who have mood disorders, psychotic disorders like depression and bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. About a third of people who are catatonic also have bipolar disorder. In the forest, Lori finds Daryl and asks him to go to town to bring Rick and Herschel back because Beth is getting a little bit worse. And Daryl is really upset. Here. Yeah. So he's sitting off in his own little camp and he's taking sticks and actually making his own arrows for his crossbow. You can see him just whittling them down to sharp points. Right. And he calls Lori olive oil from Popeye. Why? <laughs> Why? Well, first, Rick is Popeye. Shane is Bluto. <laughs> and this is not any kind of body anything, but Lori's pretty skinny and so is olive oil. <laughs> there you go. And that means that Carl is Sweet Pea. <laughs> oh, and then comes the last but that picture. also means if he has made all of these assertions that Rick is Popeye the, the one true love of olive oil and Shane is this big brutish jerk who wants her for himself but never can get her he knows about the affair Yeah. well who doesn't at yeah. this point uh, no matter what Dale says oh I don't think anybody knows everybody knows and also I do have to bring up that I, I think everyone knows really how skinny Lori is because even Glenn is saying in a couple episodes ago about how skinny she is. she need, that When uh, he was saying that she needs someone to take care of her and give her food and make sure she's eating because she's so skinny. So that kind of all makes sense. Yes. And that actually is a good survival point. Ladies, you don't worry about your size. When the zombie comes, you probably want to have some extra weight on you so you have energy in the lean years. Yes, you do. But Daryl says he's done looking for people and Lori should just go and do it herself. Mm. Thanks, Daryl. At the bar, we see that Herschel is there. So a little about this bar. We have talked about this before, that this whole street area, but the bar itself was filmed at the old Sharpsburg auction building in Sharpsburg, Georgia. So again, you can see the pharmacy off in the distance. So we all talked about that before. Herschel's like, why'd you bring Glenn? And Rick is like, "Uh, he volunteered, man. (laughs) So then they say, Beth collapsed, Herschel needs to come. Herschel is starting to see that he should have thought of the walkers a certain way. Mm -hmm. He's starting to see the the truth in what Rick and the group was saying. I thought it was kind of funny on the bar next to Herschel is a jar of what looks like milk. But then I think it's really a candle because on the other bar, there's like a shorter candle inside the jar. That's what it is. So I think it's a candle, but it looks like milk. Yeah, it's a very big cylinder, like really thick candle in there. Right. Yeah. At the farmhouse, Lori has a gun and some maps and she gets in the car to go to town. Yeah, at this point I was just like, Lori, Lori, Lori. What I mean, are you doing? here's the thing about this whole situation. She's acting like they don't know about Beth. They know about Beth. Mm-hmm. What is her problem? The weird thing is, she's mad that they went to town because they're in danger. 
right? Mm-hmm. So what's she going to do? What's her solution? She does what she wouldn't want them to do. She goes into town. Bingo. Exactly. Like, uh, And, like, she's leaving her son, who she's so concerned about, alone with the rest of the people. I mean, obviously they can take care of him, but she's the mom, and she's trying to act like she cares about what's going on, but she's really just acting out of fear. One of the times when she's in the car, she makes this turn, and there's a sign behind her that says, Church Zone. I couldn't figure out what church was there. But anyway, she's driving along. She's looking at the map and doesn't see the walker. And so she hits the walker with her car and flips it. The Both the zombie and the car. And the car. Yeah. Now, here's a little continuity thing that I thought was interesting. When she sees she's about to hit the walker with the car, she jerks the wheel to the right, which causes her to hit the walker with the front left driver's side window part. However, in the next frame, you can see that the window of her car is cracked on the right side. However, in the next episode, it's cracked on the left side. (laughs) (laughs) How many stunt cars did they use? (laughs) (laughs) All of them. I know we just said this, but I feel like her going to get Rick was really superfluous. And like almost she didn't trust him to get back on his own. I mean, she yells at him for going in the first place and then... Her brashness of actually going in the car causes her to put herself in harm and the baby. It uh, is kind of a filler scene, it's, and it's frustrating. So it's kind of like, why did right. they do it? They could have done something more dramatic with her at the farm and made right. it more meaningful. Agreed. At the bar, Herschel tells them to go back home and then basically throw Sophia in Rick's face. Mm-hmm. He said he says something that's like really a low blow. He blames them for destroying his farm and that Rick is supposed to be their leader. Ooh, I mean this this right now that that whole statement to Rick is not something that he hasn't already thought himself. In fact, he's already kicking himself for it and Herschel just hits him where it hurts. Yeah, he's just lashing as best as he can. Well, he's not just like randomly lashing out. He is targeting it. Oh yeah. Yeah, and he's totally deflecting the fact that the, he was supposed to be the leader of his house. Why would he put the zombies put the family in danger by having all of them in the mm-hmm. barn? On the wall, there are about five or six one dollar bills. I noticed they were just. It's not one of those things where you just put your first dollar bill. They had like six. Maybe they reopened it ten <laughs> times. <laughs> Herschel says he lost all his hope when Shane started shooting the walkers, and they didn't stop coming. They just continued to come, and that's when he started to realize that they weren't people. Mm-hmm. Because if they were people, they would have stopped. And next, we have this really short, like. 30 second scene of Shane and T-Dog unloading the bodies onto the ground. All the, all the walker bodies. Yeah. No point to this scene. Don't know why they decided to include this here of 30 seconds of nothing. I don't know. We know they're unloading the bodies. It happens at the end. I don't know why they decided to put this See, I know it sounds like we're just tearing this thing apart, but there's just something about this episode, man, that was, like, tedious. The one thing I wonder, because traditional TV up to this point still, I mean, it still exists. If it's not a streamer without commercials, time is everything in TV. It's like, do they have to just fill stuff because they have to hit a certain, you know, time mark? On each episode? Right. It's like I mean, I actually watched the deleted scenes for this episode, and I'm not talking about any of them, because none of them were important. It was like them saying, oh, Carol's over by the trees. You know, like, and it was, it had nothing to do with it. So good on them for deleting that stuff. It just seems like they didn't write the episode well enough to get what they wanted in there and get the ending. What happens Mm -hmm. at the end happens at the end. And then they can have that be the end of the episode so they can go to the next one on a cliffhanger. It just seems like they they didn't make some good choices. More like they kind of added so much filler to take what should have been one episode and make it into two. Correct. And this also makes me wonder if this is the beginning of the struggles with Darabont and, you know, AMC. So maybe things were falling by the wayside. Right. We are now in the bar where Rick is trying to encourage Herschel that this isn't about what they believe anymore. It's about them as a group, as a community. And Herschel's like, you're right. Let's go. Two guys walk into a bar. What's the punchline? (laughs) 
Oh, one of them gets a punchline. Let me tell you. So <laughs> the punchline is, is my shotgun. <laughs> so this is Dave and Tony. We have seen at least one of these guys many places. Tell us about Corey. Yeah, Tony is the actor Aaron Munoz. The one prominent thing I could find it that he did was Stranger Things, the one nerd nerd centric thing he did. And Dave is Michael Raymond James, who's been in a ton of stuff. Mo- most recently, he was in Prodigal Son with Hmm Jesus. From The Walking Dead, yes. starring Jesus. So yeah, uh, also in the show that I watch called Billions, True Blood, Jack Reacher, and what these guys used to watch pretty faithfully. Once upon a time, he played. He played Pinocchio in that, or what? Yes, he, he did play Pinocchio. Pinocchio in yes, that. he played Pinocchio. Yeah. I do have to say about his performance in True Blood, and I was telling Marshall this earlier, is that every time I see him in something else, he has a different accent. Yeah. And in True Blood, he has this really smooth, like, New Orleans mm-hmm. ac- accent. And I think it just kind of goes to show, like, his range, his versatility. But it's really sad that he's only in this episode. Yeah. Because I, I think that he would have been a really great addition to the cast proper. Yeah. Yes, he plays a creepy guy, but I think he would have been better cast as a bigger part. Yeah, he's a really good actor. He It's sad that he hasn't broken out in his, like, a leading role because he is really talented. He's just been doing side roles for a long time. Right. There's another character in the next episode that we see a little bit more of, and I would have thought it would have been nice if they had switched those two. I agree. A little bit about Dave. He's wearing a Strafford Sharks shirt with the number 11 on the back. And the the Strafford Sharks are a youth baseball team from Manahawkin, New Jersey, which is about 60 miles east of Philly. And that's where he says they came from Philly. He also has a necklace. And, you know, I like to try to see what people are wearing. I cannot figure out what is on his necklace at all. It kind of looks like it might be a mermaid. It definitely, it's like, it's a curved shape that kind of reminds me of a feminine figure, but I don't see like the fin tail and it looks like the arms are up. Uh, For a moment there, I thought, wait, is that the same necklace that that Andrea gave to Amy? Uh, But it's not. No, it's not. What if it's like a shark or like a... It's made out of wood or leather, right? That's what it looks like. No, it's made out of silver. Silver. Oh, it's silver? Um, Yeah, yeah, maybe it's like a feather kind of... You know what I mean? They have Mm -hmm. those like pendants that look kind of like feathers, but they're like wiggly, Mm -hmm. like a snake. Maybe it's a snake. I don't know. He also says he has a gun that he got off a cop. As soon as Rick is like, well, I'm a cop. It was a dead cop. He was already dead when I got to him. (laughs) Sure. Don't, Don't hurt me. Dave drops some really interesting nuggets in this scene, and we're gonna talk about this because the foreshadowing is beautiful first he says that they went by dc because he heard there was a refugee camp around there could this be alexandria i think it might be then they talk about a rail yard in montgomery sending trains to the country Ooh, terminus carmen terminus yes Bingo. then they talk about nebraska which has a low population and lots of guns. And years later, I find out that The Walking Dead World Beyond comes out and shows a large community of people in Nebraska, hence what this episode is called. So he's like geographical prophet. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Rick says, well, they were going to go to Fort Benning. And Dave says that someone said it was overrun with lame brains. Yeah. You gotta love and all that's... the different names for the... Yeah. Then Dave gets all shifty about how Rick and his group are living somewhere else. You know, like he's really trying to find out where it is. Rick is smart and he's like, no, nope, you can't come. When they first start this conversation, he's like, well, you guys don't look like you're set up camp here. And he's like, no, we haven't. Okay. Well, then you must have a place nearby. No, not really. Well, you're not living out of your car. Because your cars are clean. We've been living out of our car, so it's not clean like yours is. So you must have a place. And that's basically where the conversation goes. And he's like, well, take us there. Because things kind of suck for us. No. Not so much. Nope. Mm -hmm. Then Tony starts peeing in the corner. Real classy. Except that's not the corner he's peeing in. That is actually a pinball machine. And specifically, it is the Texas World Poker Tournament Pinball Machine. The same one that we see... In episode six of season one, TS-19. When they're down in the rec room in the yep. in the CDC, that's It is hysterical. the same pinball machine. And then you don't see it in this shot, 
But in the next episode, just to the right of it, is two arcade consoles. They've been repainted and have a sticker put on it, but it's probably the same ar arcade cabinets as we saw in the downstairs. The sticker that was very hastily put on there says shoot up, but that's not a gun console. That's got a joystick. I don't see any buttons. Oh, wow. So it could have been Miss Pac-Man. It could have been the Miss Pac-Man, yeah. That's funny. So Rick really tries to shut them down about joining up forces and everything. And Dave tries to say that everyone is the same because of what they had to do in this world. Why do they think they're so much better than them, etc.? Then t Tony says, I'm going to shoot you and take the farm. And I go, uh, how do you find the farm? Because as we know from what Maggie has said in previous episodes, all the farms are burned out or overrun. Mm -hmm. How do you find this farm? Then Dave is like, well, what are we supposed to do? And Rick says, well, Nebraska sounds nice. <laughs> yeah, it does. Dave tries to start pulling up his gun from the counter. And so Rick is like, okay, cool. I'll shoot you. I'll shoot you. And this is the first time that Rick has killed a live person since he woke up in the hospital. So we're going to add this to his tally. Mm -hmm. So far we have one for Shane, two for Rick. Mm -hmm. And when Tony gets shot, he hits the wall and he starts sliding down. And right next to him is a sign that says, I live my life hard and fast and with no regrets. That's what I do. Yeah, that's what you did. <laughs> and I think... Herschel gets that Rick is serious about protecting him and his farm mm -hmm. at this point. There's now this whole like scene where they go back and forth between the farm and the bar where they are burning the bodies. They've got some rags on the sticks. And I noticed the rags are the same ones they use to mark the grid when they're looking for Sophia. What's really interesting about this part right here where they are burning the bodies is that when Shane throws his torch to the pile to ignite it, to the right of the pile, on like the top but right, there is an obvious plastic head of like a mannequin or a crash dummy or something. It's not, I mean, it's very, the sun is like shining on it. You can tell it's plastic and not skin. It's weird. They are playing the song called The Regulator by Clutch. And the lyrics that you hear are, oh, I see that lantern trimmed low, burning in our home. And though I feel like crying, I swear tonight I'll cry no more. Sounds like it's about Daryl and, <laughs> and Carol both. I think yeah. you both can relate to that because that's kind of like. I think it's kind of like all the characters are now finally being like, okay, we we had this hope that we thought we had. We're we're done. We don't have that. We have right. to move on. Exactly. Yeah, it was the question, the question of Sophia. And then once mm -hmm. the question was answered, they're like, okay, now we'll go deal with what we have to deal with, what we feel about it, but we're going. Right. And for Herschel, it was, are these people sick or are they walkers? Well, that's been answered and I'm not going to get my family back. Right. To sum up, really, in this episode is who, ki who got killed in this episode? Tony and Dave. But it is a big turning point. It is a big turning point with the killing of humans because that becomes the, you know, the measure uh, becomes part of the questions that come up later with they, whenever they encounter somebody. Right. Um, At the beginning of the season, it was a whole, we don't kill the living thing. And now all of a sudden, not three or four episodes later. Oops. This won't be the last. And I want to do also bring up that Herschel in the next episode has interesting reaction to what has happened. Yes. And we will talk about that next time. But right. what I do want to talk about one last thing before we go is the name of the episode. I got some interesting information about this because Nebraska, yes, it's called Nebraska because that is where they talk about this whole community being in Nebraska. But here's what I got from Rick Wikipedia. I almost called it Wikipedia. So Nebraska was also notable as Ground Zero, i.e. the target of Russian nuclear bombs in the 1950s and 60s in the event of a nuclear war. Therefore, the Federal Civil Defense Administration devised plans that would give civilians a chance to survive a nuclear war and cartons of Nebraskits, <laughs> compressed biscuits made from grain, and dairy-based milk bars collectively designed to satisfy survivors' nutritional requirements during a stay in a fallout shelter were stored in fallout shelters throughout the United States. So this is kind of like the ground zero. And so what we're getting at, this is this is the spot where we are preparing 
for what's to come. Right. Maybe both literally and figuratively in this episode, what happens next? I think that's what Ms. Maggie was saying. What happens now with us, with the group? Who's staying and who goes? Mm -hmm. And really, that is the end of this episode. Although, it's kind of like a two-part arc thing happening, and we get into a lot more next week when we talk about Season 2, Episode 9, Trigger Finger. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out.